Please welcome Julia Serrano. Yes. Hello. Wow. I can barely see all you because these are reading glasses. So ha. <laughs> um, so right now I'm juggling a bunch of different uh, writing projects, and one of them that is kind of I'm excited about, but it's still kind of new and, and early on, is a surreal and somewhat silly novel-ish sort of thing. Um, that I'm writing under the pen name Cat Cataclysm, who no. also happens to be the protagonist narrator. And some of the pieces talk about the changing Bay Area. Um, this one not so much, but this one does touch on queer intimacy and what that means to this character. The these days, there's this popular perception that society is now totally A-OK -okay with same-sex relationships, which ignores the fact that this is far from the truth, plus most of us grew up a time when this was most definitely not OK. And many people seem to have drunk the, we're just like you except for our sexual orientation Kool-Aid, so they don't even consider the possibility that the experience of being queer might be considerably different from what straight people experience. So what is it like being queer? Some of you may now be asking. Well, I would say that it's kind of like bicycling to Alameda. But not just any old bike trip to Alameda. You are going to the west side of Alameda for some inexplicable reason. And people are arguing over whether you felt the need to go to West Alameda because it's in your genes or poor parent-child dynamics or because fetal hormones have hardwired your brain that way. But you couldn't care less about any of these debates. All you know is that you really need to get to West Alameda. And it doesn't matter why. Plus, to you, there's a clear double standard here, as nobody would ever question you if you told them that you're bicycling to downtown Alameda instead. Now, if you were going to downtown Alameda, as everybody expects of you, you could simply bike over either the Park Street or Fruitvale bridges, both totally safe, and arrive at your destination. Easy squeezy. But for West Alameda, the most direct route for you is the Posey Tube, which was built back in 1927, well before urban planners wore, planners wore their pretty little heads over bike lanes. All they left you is a one-person wide pathway perched on one side of the tunnel, just above the racing cars below, with only a guardrail separating you from your impending death. <laughs> the signs tell you to walk your bike, but if you did that, you'd be in the tube all day. So you, you precariously pedal your way across the Oakland estuary, albeit way underneath all the water. And it's outrageously loud in the tube due to the cavernous echoing of all the car and bus engines. It's almost deafening. And your eyes are peeled on the tight path that you are navigating as one small slip-up could potentially cast you over the guard rail. So your senses are overloaded, and you are on the verge of freaking out, or screaming, or crying, or dying, or possibly some combination thereof. But you keep on going. Not because you're brave or courageous, which I suppose are pretty much the same thing, but because there's no other way to West Alameda, and that's where you need to go. <laughs> But then, lo and behold, you see someone approaching you from the other direction. And you have to go get off your bike, and they need to do the same because the path is so narrow. And you'd think this would be a huge inconvenience, having lost all the momentum you built up, but strangely, it's not. And as you squeeze past one another, the two of you make eye contact and smile. Not the fake sorts of smiles that accompany the exchange of everyday pleasantries, but rather the genuine knowing smiles of people who share the same intense and potentially traumatic experience. And in that brief moment, sorry, in that brief moment, the two of you make a profound human connection unlike anything you've felt before. Because only a moment ago, you were both completely alone in a dark tunnel, freaking out and afraid of dying. Both, but now both of you realize that you're not really alone after all. And it's beautiful. But it's also a little sad that you had to experience all that fear and loneliness in the first place. So that's what being queer is like, at least in my estimation. <laughs> now, queer communities, it's an entirely different thing. That would be like if you decided to round up all the people who have ever bicycled through the posy tube and put them all in the same room together. <laughs> At first, you would all bond over your shared experiences traversing and surviving the tunnel. But fairly shortly after that, you would, have, you would all start to realize that you have nothing in common but this one thing. <laughs> After all, you each come from different backgrounds and have different personal political views, not to mention different bicycles. <laughs> and factions would develop. 
for instance, between people who bicycle through the tube in different directions. Because let's face it, while the mainstream majority doesn't understand why anyone in their right mind would ride their bike through the cozy tube, it'll be easier for them to accept people who desire to go to downtown Oakland rather than those who desire to go to West Alameda. <laughs> because why would you go to West Alameda? And people who cross the tube every day on their way to work would start to look down on the people who've only done it sporadically for occasional visits. <laughs> or, or the people who used to do it all the time but no longer do because they've switched, since switched jobs or moved elsewhere. <laughs> And of course, the former group would probably call these latter groups something demeaning yet pithy, like posers, in order to validate their experiences. Even though they did have those experiences, those special moments of fear and recognition and intimacy amidst the precarious cacophonous tunnel. So now we're going to skip ahead. I'm going to get support. <laughs> So, okay, we're skipping ahead in the same chapter. This is Kat talking about some of her experiences when she first moved to San Francisco to explore her queer identity. Anyway, there's so much to learn when you first come out as queer. For instance, there are all these bands you're supposed to be listening to. <laughs> because they're the only ones speaking directly to the lesbian experience. And there are specific haircuts, style of dress, and even tattoos that you can sport in order to signify to people in the know that you are family. <laughs> all of Gabriella's friends, this is her friend from college who she knew was queer, so she moved out. Um, all of Gabriella's friends seemed so cool, and they were so patient and unconditionally accepting of me, at least at first. In retrospect, it was probably because they viewed me as a baby dyke, which is what they call someone who has just recently come out into the community. They took me under their wings, showed me the ropes, and other mixed metaphors. <laughs> If I said or did anything that they perceived to be incorrect or naive, they would let it slide, on account that I'm still in the throes of throwing off the chains of heteronormativity. <laughs> but after months of enculturation, your baby dyke status eventually fades, and you become a fully mature dyke in their eyes. And, after, and if at this point, rather than listening to the usual lesbian bands, who are fine, but there's only so much folk music and punk rock you can take, and seriously, lesbians, explore more genres of music. <laughs> anyway, if you instead play classic 70s prog rock records, all of your dyke roommates are going to look at you weird. Like, disdainfully weird. Because this music is not in any way sapphic, and you really should know better by now. <laughs> And if you choose not to get an androgynous or asymmetrical haircut because your personal preference is for length and symmetry, or not to get a wrist star or labor tattoo because of your trypanophobia, then some people will question your queerness. Even though tattoos and haircuts have nothing to do with your sexual orientation. I mean, these things are merely signifiers. And having recently dropped out of a grad school linguistics program, you are highly aware that the relationship between signifier and the signified is completely arbitrary. <laughs> or at least that's what Saucer said. So why risk getting a rainbow tattoo when 20 or 30 years from now, the signifier rainbow might mean shopping cart or macadamia nut? You never know. <laughs> Your new queer friends will cut you some slack when it comes to your haircut, taste of music, and so forth, until you meet that guy, the sweet and soft-spoken one who works at the bookstore a few blocks away. And so we're gonna skip ahead, they have a smart conversation, they go on a date, and then, so of course you take him home with you. And the next day this becomes a big scandal, because your roommate saw him leave the following morning, and so they start interrogating you. And you're like, why does it matter who I sleep with? And someone says, well, is he at least gay or trans? So you respond, no, he's heterosexual and cisgender, although you didn't use the word cisgender, because as far as you know, it wasn't even invented back then. <laughs> but you did tell the bookstore guy that you're a lesbian and he was fine with it. And men who date lesbians have to be at least a little bit queer, don't they? And someone says, date, as in more than once? And you respond, yes, the two of you are planning on going out again in a couple days. Then one of your roommates says she doesn't feel safe with the straight man coming over on a regular basis. And a second roommate seconds that emotion. And you're trying to stress how sweet this guy is. He wouldn't hurt a fly. 
Plus, he's a minority himself, although not a sexual minority, other than the fact that he's dating a lesbian now, which is at least somewhat sexual minority-ish, although your roommates are not buying it. And the conversation continues on and on for almost an hour, but about halfway through, your mind starts to wonder. First, you wish Gabriella was here, because you know she would totally stick up for you. Second, it strikes you that there's this word called bisexual, and perhaps maybe you should consider the possibility that maybe it applies to you. And third, you think about how ever since your earliest memories, you always felt like you were different from everyone else. You never really fit in, no matter where you were or who you were with. And before today happened, you temporarily thought that you would finally solve that problem. You didn't fit in before because you were a queer person in a straight world. And now that you found a queer community, you finally fit in. But now you realize that you don't fit into queer communities either. Maybe it's not that you're queer. Perhaps your problem is you're simply weird. <laughs> not just with regards to your sexual orientation, but in a more fundamental, systemic way. <laughs> Perhaps you are someone who, for some inexplicable reason, simply needs to go to West Alameda. Nobody understands why, just ignore them and go to West Alameda. <laughs> Metaphorically, of course. But seriously, there isn't a whole lot in West Alameda. They don't even have a bar to stop. So why not try moving to downtown Oakland instead? Thanks.